Chapter 19 Cantankerberg Part 1 In the morning, they buried the pony in a soft sandy area under the withered willows. It was the only place nearby where the earth was not made of hard black rock, impenetrable with a shovel. Standing knee-deep in the hole, Mars sunk the blade, and it struck a solid object. He uncovered a segment of the rib cage of some long-forgotten creature. Well, at least she'll have some company, he said. They lowered Angel in the grave, and Mars covered her with his blood-soiled tunic. All the horses gathered around as Mars and Johnny took turns shoveling dirt onto the body. They bowed their heads, hoofed the ground, and sang a dirge together. Antiphonally, a murmuration of snorts and whinnies, sung in a round, circling the final resting place of their equine sister. In the distance, the machine beasts were already clearing their throats for the day's work. Mab said she would take the horses back the way they had come, but the crusaders must hasten on to their destiny. She helped hitch Trespasser to the wagon. The harness had to be retooled to fit his broad shoulders. The horse had a fire in his eyes. He seemed fully cognizant of the adventure ahead. In place of trespasser, Mab chose a young shy mare to ride on her return. Before mounting, she kissed Mars full on the mouth with a passion that seemed part portent. Without another word, she leapt on the mare's bare back and disappeared around the wall, with the herd following her obediently, single file. <clears throat> Trespasser's power was almost too great for the little wagon. The staves rocked wildly, and in a very short time, all the pots and pans had loosened from their hooks and clattered to the floorboards. The axles creaked and the wheels wobbled. Johnny grasped the sideboard tightly to keep from being thrown to the ground. Mars, however, <clears throat> held the reins loosely and stared straight ahead, lost in thought, silent. In any case, it wasn't long before conversation was impossible, for they were passing through the very heart of the mine. The machine beasts were everywhere and the din was deafening. It took all day to cross the pit, but by late afternoon there was more dust than noise, for the road had diverged from the course of the haulers, and here and there the earth had been wasted of its usefulness. On both sides deep gouge scars lay open some of them bleeding a black fluid tar, and in places the fires smoldered, the very earth blistering in its own heat. By the time the smoke cleared and they could see the other side, a low ridge, nothing like the cliffs they had descended, with a gentle notch for the road to pass through. Mars spoke the first words he had uttered since Mab and her, her horses had disappeared around the wall. Jimmy Clearlight, I've never been fed anything that tasted so bad. Johnny sighed. Why don't you call me by my real name? Mars didn't answer. He was silent for so long that Johnny was afraid he wouldn't speak again from here to Ironweed. But that didn't happen. 
A woman who travels with 75 wild horses carries a lot of weight, said Mars at last. But she doesn't know everything. I call you Clearlight for your protection. I told you that. Johnny pondered for a while, and he remembered something that troubled him. Once, I slept in a shelter that was used by the black coats. They had some kind of device in there, and a book where they wrote things. They were keeping record of all the places I had traveled since I left King Corn. Mars frowned. Nah, clear light, you're not supposed to think about that. Don't you remember the day we buried the box in the graveyard? I told you, you were being tracked. Johnny could feel the puzzle quivering, another piece about to fall into place. How do they do it, he asked. Do you remember what Mab said? How the people today use things that were made by the old ones, even though they don't understand them? The dolmens. Yeah, whatever. Well, the old ones left things in the sky. They circled the earth. I guess maybe you don't know that either. The earth is round, but that's another story. Anyhow, the men of knowledge figured out how to talk to these things in the sky. That's what we buried in the graveyard. The things in the sky were watching you. The blinkers? These aren't children playing with toys, Jimmy Clearlight. If we really are going to fulfill this destiny, we have to be very careful. They rolled out of the pit at dusk. The sun was a visible ball of orange sinking in the west, and ahead of them lay a city, a word Johnny had never heard before crossing the border. It shimmered through layers of haze, a maze of towers as tall as mountains, but most of them were frayed at the top as if they had been eaten by flames and battered by fierce winds. Light glowed from the lower windows. Further up, there was darkness. The glass shattered. The walls crumbled and stained with soot. On the street, life teemed. Lights flashed. Vehicles bustled. Crowds of people flowed here and there like water. Cantankerbird announced Mars, the first step on the power chain. It will take all day tomorrow to get through it. On the other side is the Onyx Highway to Ironweed. <clears throat> the entrance to the city was abrupt. No shanty town or abandoned factories lined the road down the ridge above the mines. Two enormous rusty iron gates slouched open and a tattered banner sagged between the towers. Can Tankerberg. Nobody seemed to be leaving or arriving, but the moment the wagon crossed the threshold, the travelers found themselves engulfed in a turgid sea of humanity. Trespasser snorted and stomped his hooves. He had braved the machine beast of Perpetua without balking, and now he pressed into the crowd with a fierce valor. Men, women, and children, mostly wearing dingy browns and grays, crowded around carts and tables where vendors sold their wares. The air was filled with a succession of shifting smells, greasy meat fat, weighty spices, wafts of incense and smoke, mold and decay. Whole carcasses hung from hoofs, from hooks, I'm sorry, hooks. Johnny could not always identify the animal and some looked disturbingly human. A man jostled past carrying a tray of pig's heads. A woman was stacking sheaves of some bright green foliage. 
shouts and chants and the clang of hammers, the whine of belts, the throb of pistons. A few people rode on the backs of the buzzing insects Johnny had seen in the previous city. They wove their way impatiently through the dense crowds. A vehicle approached. A large green wheeled tortoise with a man on its back. The man was armored and carried what Johnny had learned was called a rifle. He spoke into a cone that amplified his voice. Step to the left and keep moving. They passed an alley where a crowd had formed a circle. Two, bo two young boys, completely naked, were fighting with broken bottles while voices goaded them on. Each had one leg chained to a rung in the street so they could not make full frontal contact. They swung their shards wildly at each other, their arms shredded and bloody. A pot of money stood on a table nearby. Mars pulled the wagon up to a vendor, jumped down and returned with an armload of puffy baked things. Here, eat this, he handed one to Johnny. It was flaky and filled with some kind of meat. It tasted rancid, but Johnny was too hungry to complain. In the falling dark, people around them were setting up colored lamps and the sound of drums reverberated from somewhere above. A pretty girl with a dirty face walked across the street carrying an armload of roses and someone on a balcony whistled. Two dogs broke out of an alley fighting over the pelt of a rabbit. In a brightly lit kitchen, old men were playing a game with ceramic tiles clacking on a metal table. I know she's right, said Mars with a sigh. This world has been given over to chaos and cruelty but it's hard for me to let it go. It's a beautiful chaos, and there's a sweet sadness in the cruelty. I wish I played an instrument like you, Jimmy Clearlight. It's music that bridges the worlds. He gummed the last bit of his pastry and spat out a bone. Let's keep moving. I, I know a place where we can spend the night. I have some business there. When the light had completely faded from the visible patches of the sky, they entered a short, narrow canyon that ended at a wall on which was painted a huge eye with a delta-shaped iris, squiggly lines of color emanating from its orb. Mars pressed a button on a post and the eye began to move. The wall shuddered and rolled up, re revealing a dark, cavernous space. Back on the buckboard, Mars goaded Trespasser, and they entered. Shapes appeared out of the gloom. There were animals and stalls, some bearded goats reclining on a padded pallet, a cluck of chickens scratching in a pen, a small donkey munching on a pile of straw, Light burst from an opening door. A man appeared, a young man, dressed in white robes like a mummer. His face cleanly shaven, long straight hair flowing over his shoulders. Holy Bezel, Mars Daniel! When did your pony get so big? Pony died. What you see there is a horse. How you been, Jason? Mars and the young man embraced with their arms clasped. Just counting the days. We knew you'd come, but we didn't know when. What'd you bring us? Something brand new, my friend. It grows on the southern slopes. They call it the illumination. Jason laughed. Well, good. Gets pretty dark around here. Who's your friend? Clearlight, jump down. Meet the host. Jimmy Clearlight, Jason Argonite. 
first child born in free land. Jason shook Johnny's hand. Any friend of Mars, just leave the horse here. I'll have Bambi take care of him. Isabel will be so surprised. They entered the bottom of a well. Johnny looked up, flights of stairs ascending in a spiral. He counted eight landings before the stairs disappeared into darkness. They started up, their footsteps reverberating in the hollows above. On the seventh landing, Jason threw open a door. A cool breeze rushed out of the room, redolent with the aroma of evergreens. The room was full of trees, miniature pines and cedars thriving under a bank of soft white light along the ceiling. The floor was spongy mulch like the floor of a forest. A girl sat at a table. She had long blonde hair and she wore a robe like Jason's except hers was cornflower blue. When she saw Mars, she gasped, then laughed, jumped up, and threw her arms around his neck. Of course you'd come today. I dreamed you last night. Introductions were made. From somewhere among the trees, the girl, the girl produced a large, slightly soiled, produced, I'm sorry, produced four slightly, four large, slightly soiled cushions. In the higher branches, tiny birds flitted and the walls and the ceilings were painted sky blue with shades of distant mountains. The artifice was so effective, Johnny found himself drawn into the illusion as if he were sitting in the woods above King Corn with, on a sunny afternoon with Bear Claw, Ant, and Jocko. The girl's name was Isabel. She passed around mugs full of clear cold water and the four of them settled into the cushions with the birds chirping overhead. The girl began to speak. Her voice commanded full attention. It drew all the focus in the room toward her like a northernmost attractor. This must seem very strange to you, Johnny. It's a long, strange story. But we have all night. Sit deep, and I will tell you. Jason leaned into her and stroked her arm. She tells it well, Jimmy. Listen closely. <laughs> 